Multivariable calculus is the, is the calculus of functions of more than one variable, so multivariables, or many variables, at least two. And um, because of this, we need to discuss looking at points in more than one dimension. Uh, so you're probably used to the real line, a one-dimensional thing. You're probably used to the xy plane, a two-dimensional thing, a uh, two-dimensional um, object where you specify pairs of real numbers. We actually need to look at higher dimensional uh, space, and it's called Euclidean space. And so we just need to get some basic terminology out, out of the way, um, things that replace open intervals and closed intervals, um, some basic terminology. Don't get too caught up in it. This is just so that we can discuss things in a reasonable way in later sections. So um, you should be familiar with the real line, R. Uh, some people write the open interval from minus infinity to infinity. This is the set of real numbers. We typically picture it as and call it the real line. Um, picture it as a line, uh, a plus direction, a negative direction, an origin somewhere. And it's just the set of real numbers. Um, and we have a notion of distance, which you may not have thought of much because it's so basic in the reals, that if you've got a point B and a point A on the real line, what's the distance between A and B? The distance between A and B, uh, well, if B is really greater than A, like I've drawn it, it would just be B minus A. Um, but we want to allow for the possibility that A is the bigger one. So it's either B minus A or A minus B, and the way to write that in one formula is it's the absolute value of, a, of B minus A or A minus B, same thing. And then I want to write this in a, in, a, in a more complicated way because it generalizes more nicely to higher dimensions. And this, the absolute value of a number is the same as the square root of the number squared. So that's the real line together with the notion of distance on it. All right, what about two-dimensional space, R2? Most people picture this as the xy plane. It's the set of ordered pairs of real numbers. Our favorite name for the for the entries in the order of pair are x and y. and y. That's why we call it the xy plane. And as I'm sure you're familiar with, we draw the positive x-axis going to the right. We draw a perpendicular axis with the positive y-axis going up. Uh, they intersect at the origin. Um, and there's a notion of distance there, which you probably, probably know already. If you've got a point x1, y1, and a point x2, y2, then what's the distance between those points? Well, you can, you can use the Pythagorean theorem if you draw this right triangle. Then the coordinates of this point, well, it has the same y-coordinate as that, and the same x-coordinate as that, so it's x2, y1, and then you should know the Pythagorean theorem, the distance between the point x1, y1 and x2, y2. Well, it's this the length of this side, which you should know this side squared plus this side squared equals that side squared, or what's the same thing. The length of that side is the square root of the length of this side squared plus the length of that side squared. The length of this side, they have the same y-coordinate. You take the distance, uh, the difference of the x-coordinates, and you could take the absolute its distance as the absolute value, or that length is the absolute value of x2 minus x1. 
So, but we're going to square it anyway, so we don't need to put the absolute value signs in. We could. So, um, the length of this side squared is x2 minus x1 squared. The length of this side squared, x2, remains the same. And this length is y, y2 minus y1, except we want it squared. All right, the absolute value of y2 minus y1, but we want it squared. So you get this. This is the distance between two points in R2. Well, you may notice in R1 it was the square root of the difference of the coordinates. In R2, it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the difference between the corresponding coordinates. All right, what happens in R3? So this you may not be familiar with, but some of you may have looked at it already. We try to draw three-dimensional space, you should think a space that we live in, in perspective in the, we're, we're drawing on a plane, I mean, after all this, this board is flat, but we try to draw this in perspective so it looks like we're drawing something three-dimensional. And typically, in math, we draw a positive x and y axis and a positive z axis in more or less these directions. So you should think of this as indicating three dimensions. You can think of the xy plane as being down here where z is zero. Um, being down here where z is zero, think of that as the floor. And then think of z as measuring your height above the floor, negative z indicating how far into the floor you are. This is, I'm trying to draw a picture of R3. This is the set of ordered triples. Which, and we usually call the entries the coordinates, the components, x, y, z, set of ordered triples of real numbers. That's frequently referred to as XYZ space. And you should think of it essentially as the space we live in. So, yeah, really think of the XY plane as the floor. Picture that in perspective. There's a, a subtlety in what we draw. We've got what if you didn't want to draw things just like in this orientation, but wanted to turn things a little bit. Um, one of the things we do when we draw the positive x, y, and z axes, there's a preference for what's known as a right-handed coordinate system. And what that means is that if you take your right hand, I'm not joking, take your right hand, if you point your index finger in the direction of the positive x-axis and your middle finger in the direction of the positive y-axis, your thumb should point in the direction of the positive z-axis. If you're using your right hand, this would be wrong if you're using your left hand. Um, so wh what, wh what difference does this make? Well, it's just a question of how you're picturing things and talking about things. It's a choice that we make. Um, but just so, you can, just so you can get a feel for what's going on, suppose I put the positive, suppose I wanted, for some bizarre reason, to orient my z-axis over here. Well, yeah, let's put the z-axis over here, the positive z, and the positive x over here. The question is, all right, if I want a right-handed coordinate system, should, should positive y be out that way, or should it be back that way. So which way is the positive y direction for a right-handed coordinate system? So you should think index finger is the x coordinate, um, thumb, so positive x, thumb is positive z. So yeah, the y coordinate is your middle, the y component is your middle finger and it would point outward. So yeah, the positive y would be here. This is still a right-handed coordinate system. On the other hand, if you put z here and x here, 
and you still want to draw a right-handed coordinate system, well then, your thumb is Z, your index finger is, I'll need to turn, your, your thumb is Z, your index finger is X, and now my middle finger points into the board. The positive Y direction is into the board, which is what I'm trying to draw in perspective when I draw this line. All right. So anyway, typically, unless somebody says something, to the contrary, you should assume that when we're drawing XYZ space, we're always drawing it right-handed. Um, what's the notion of distance here? Again, you can do it by the Pythagorean theorem. You can take two points in space. You can drop perpendiculars and make right triangles. And if you do this, what you'll find is the distance between two points in space is given by, hopefully, what seems like the obvious generalization of the other two things that we've written. It's the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences of the corresponding components. So, so that's distance in our three. All right. It's true that in, in multivariable calculus, the functions you care about the most are functions of two and three variables. However, there are a lot of things that we'll do that will apply to functions of any number of variables, any finite number. And so we really do want our n, where n could be any positive integer. So um, we won't do a lot of things with our n, where n is greater than or equal to four, but we need to go ahead and define it. This is the set of ordered, they're called intuples. <laughs> you can't say pairs, triples, you could say quadruples, quintuples, and then you just start, about, start talking about intuples, ordered intuples of x1, x2, xn of n real numbers. That's Rn. So, for instance, a point in R4. This is a point in R4. Um, because we get tired of writing uh, this long expression in dot, dot, dots, frequently we indicate multi-components, so I should say the, the individual Xi's, are called the either the coordinates or the components of the point. And we get tired of writing out all the components sometimes. Sometimes we just want to refer to this, but we want to indicate that there's more than one real number, at least that we're allowing for the possibility of more than one. Um, so I will write x, and then in print, what you do in a book, and if you're reading the book, you will see it's bold. It's a bold-faced x. But when you're writing on a, on a blackboard, it's, or when you're writing on paper, it's too hard to indicate when you bolded something or not. So the typical replacement for bold when you're writing by hand is to underline. Um, so this, <laughs> you should look, think of this as a bold face X, but I'll have to underline it. 
Um, all right, so this is a point in R4. What people usually ask at this point is, oh my God, how do you picture R4? How do you picture four dimensions? And the answer is, you don't. There's no reason to think that these four numbers, it's true, we picture R2 as the XY plane, so we can see points, and we picture R3, XYZ space, but in general, these numbers might not even like, define positions. You might be, this might be listing uh, the amounts of four different chemicals that you have on hand in grams or something. You know, it's just, I've got four chemicals, chemical one, chemical two, chemical three, and chemical four, and here's how many grams of each of them I have. It's just four numbers in order. How you, what it means depends on the context. It depends on what you're told the different components mean physically. Um, there's no reason why you should think of this as specifying position. And so don't, I mean, yes, there are, People go, oh, R4 is space and time. Yes, you could pick three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. But it depends on context. And no, you shouldn't try to picture R4 or higher dimensional space. It's just, as a set, it's just the set of you know, R4, four real numbers, the set of the set of thing, the set of four tuples, the set of quadruples of four real numbers in order. Um, and distance. How do we define the distance between two points? Well, if you've got a point A, which would have coordinates A1 through AN, and you've got a point B, and it has coordinates B1 through BN, then it should come as no surprise to you that distance between A and B is the square root of, you just take the differences of each of the corresponding coordinates, components, square them, add, and take the square root. And you may, but now you might be saying, wait, 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 but how do you prove that's true? How do you prove the Pythagorean theorem in more dimensions? And there we get, we do one of those devious mathematician things. In higher dimen, oops, I left off a square. In higher dimensions, you take this as the definition. This is a definition of the distance between the points. It's true you don't picture it, so, and you can't do a Pythagorean theorem. This is the definition of the distance between two points in higher dimension. Of course, it's designed to correspond to the distance we have in R2 and R3. Um, you can actually use other stranger notions of distance, but Rn together with this notion of distance is called Euclidean, n-dimensional Euclidean space. So <coughs> if you take the set of ordered n-tuples of real numbers together with this notion of distance, this defines n-dimensional Euclidean space. So Euclidean refers to the fact that we're using this as our notion of distance n-dimensional Euclidean space. Or it's frequently shortened, just Euclidean n-space. And you don't try to picture it for n greater than or equal to 4, usually. Um, Okay, uh, we need a bunch of basic notions from, you know, we need to generalize open and closed intervals and all the things we'll need to talk about later when we're looking at functions and calculus. So, you know, we talk about the origin a lot in the real line, in the xy plane, in xyz space. So, <coughs> not surprisingly, the origin in Rn is, we denote it by a bold zero, or on the board, an underlined zero. Regardless of the dimension, we don't usually indicate the n. You should know which. It's 
n zeros in order. So that's the origin. Well, that's easy. But now we'd like to define an open set. And um, it's not particularly easy to define an open set. Uh, it's not too hard, but first we have to define something analogous to an open interval in the real line, and that will be an open n-dimensional ball in Euclidean space. And while we're at it, we'll define the closed ball. So definition. Suppose I'm going to start using some set notation. We'll need it pretty seriously shortly. Suppose P is a point in Rn. So this is a little epsilon. It's, in this context, it means element of or is an element of. So suppose P is an element of Rn. Um, then, and, oh, and R is a positive real number. Then the open open ball of radius r centered at p in rn is what should it be an open ball centered at p is um, and I, I really uh, I'm going to write a lot of set notation, but I'll explain it. Um, all right, so you indicate the center. Here's the radius. Here's the dimension of the ball. But this is the open ball. It is the, so I'm right, this is a curly set bracket. It's a set of all those x's, n, r, n. This line should be read such that. Such that what? Such that, well, we're trying to generalize like an open interval centered, centered at a point, or in R2, we're trying to generalize an open disk centered at a point, um, such that the distance between x and p is strictly less than r. And close the set. So you read this as, uh, is, well, this is hard to read, b, b uh, sub r soup n of p, anyway, the, the ball, the open ball of radius r um, centered at p in dimension n, or the n-dimensional open ball of radius r centered at p, is the set of all those x's in rn whose, whose distance from p is less than r. So understand what we're doing, it's just in R2, all we're doing is here's P, and the open ball is what you picture is an open disk. Right? It's all those points. So here's the radius R. It's open. I've dotted this. I've shaded it because you include all the stuff inside there. I've dotted that boundary because it's not there because I picked strictly less than R here. Um, so that's an open ball in Rn. What's a closed ball, just because it's easy to do this, well, the closed ball, well, you include the boundary. The closed ball at radius R is this one, where you allow equals R. So in R2, it's easy, it's all this stuff. <clears throat> Understand, some people would call that a circle. You need to be careful in multivariable calculus 
The circle is just the boundary itself. When we refer to the ball or the disc, it's the stuff inside, and it really makes a difference now um, for us. So, for instance, you hear people talk, the area of a circle is pi r squared. No, circle is just the outside part. It really doesn't have an area. The, the area inside a circle of radius r is pi r squared. Um, so the area of the disk. All right, um, those are open and closed balls. While we're here, we might as well just find the spheres. The spheres are the boundary. So suppose an r is a positive real number. Then the n minus 1 dimensional sphere. So now we just want that boundary, the n minus 1 dimensional sphere of radius r centered at p is is a set of blocks such that this distance equals r. All right, I have to make a, a couple of comments about this. So here we are, here we are in R2. And now we don't have that anymore. Here's P, here's R, and this is what we're now calling an, okay, a one-dimensional sphere. Do we really call a circle a one-dimensional sphere? Yes, you do, but typically we would really call it a circle, but this is a, a one-dimensional sphere. Understand that the dimension refers to the dimension of the circle itself. It's one-dimensional. It looks like you've taken the one-dimensional real line and curved it or bent it around. The inside of it is two-dimensional, and it sits inside two dimensions, but the circle itself is a one-dimensional object, and that's why this dimension went down even though the points sit in Rn. Um, all right, so you might be going, <laughs> what is all of this? What is this awful set notation? What are you doing? And <laughs> it's not, you probably would be more comfortable if we skipped all the set notation and just wrote that we know what distance is. So we're using the Euclidean distance, so the square roots of the, of the, some of the squares of the differences between the coordinates. So let's write P is P, P1, let's write it out in coordinates, P1 through Pn, and that's what we're thinking of as a fixed point. The x's, which are variable, x1, x2, xn, then Saying that the distance, the, the ball then, the open ball of radius r centered at p, I'm just going to omit the of radius r centered at p, well, you want the distance between x and p to be strictly less than r. That means that square root of the sum of the squares. But you could square both sides. The inequality would stay in the same direction. And, um, what you would get, what you would see is that, oh, it means it's the set of those x's such that x1 minus p1 squared plus x2 minus p2 squared plus xn minus pn squared is less than r squared. That's all that all that boils down to. The open ball of, the open ball b r P n is the set of those x's that satisfy this. What's the closed ball? The, the closed ball would be this. Uh, I didn't give us a notation for the closed ball. I should have. I don't think I changed it when I was writing it. To indicate the closed ball versus the open ball, we put this overline on the ball that indicates the closed ball instead of the open ball. Um, the n minus 1 sphere, n minus 1 dimensional sphere then, Sn R P, it's just given by, oh, this equals R squared. So maybe I'll just write, right? The sphere is where this 
is equal to this. And that's what you should be used to in, like when you're talking about a circle, you take x minus the x coordinate of the center squared plus y minus the y coordinate of the center squared equals the radius squared. That's how you define a circle, typically, of radius r centered at p. All right, so those are balls and spheres in Euclidean space. And an open ball is kind of our most basic open set in Rn. It's not everything we want to call an open set, but it's our most basic kind of open set. And we define open sets in terms of open balls. So, all right. Um, I'm going to need, well, it would be helpful to have a little more set notation. So, um, E is a subset of Rn. Well, that means that everything that's in E is in Rn. So, that E is some sub-collection. But it might, it might be all of Rn. A subset doesn't disallow the possibility that it's everything. If and only if every point So E is a set. Every element of E is in Rn. What we write is this. Um, some people write that symbol to mean subset and still allow the possibility of equals. I like to write this explicit kind of or equals that looks like less than or equal to. That's not the sharp less than sign. It's a curly kind of less than sign. But um, you write E as a subset of Rn. And more generally, if you have two sets, you know, this denote means A is a subset of B. which means every element of A is in B. All right. I needed that because what we need to talk about open subsets of Rn. So, um, So the definition. What we want from an open subset is that if a point's in an open subset, every point close to it, close enough to it, is in there. Um, suppose E is a subset of Rn. So we have some points, some, some set of points in Rn. Then E is open. an open subset of Rn if and only if if and only if so let me well I'll do an example in a minute if and only if for all P in E we want to say that Points that are close enough to P, points in Rn that are close enough to P, are also in E. That's what we want open to mean. And the nice way to say that is there's some small open ball around P in Rn which is completely contained in E. So for all P in an E, there exists.
r greater than zero so that the open ball of radius r centered at p in rn is completely contained in E. This is what it means for you to be an open set. Um, so for instance, consider the set of xy in R2, so the ordered pairs in R2, such that x is greater than 0. Well, that looks like where x is greater than 0, that's all the stuff over here where the x-coordinate's greater than 0, and indicate that we're not including where x equals 0, we would usually dot, put dots here on the missing part. So, why is that an open set? And the answer is that if we take, if we take any point in the set, a small enough open ball centered at that point is in the set. Like, we could take this open ball. We could take, here we could take this open ball. So, what the, the part, the, the interesting part is what happens as you get close to this dotted line, that you have to take the ball smaller and smaller as you get close to here. So, if you take a point there, then you could take you could take a ball small enough about that point to stay away from that dotted boundary. If the boundary were there, we wouldn't have an open set because if that line were there, we could take a point on that line and then there'd be an open ball around it. Every open ball around it would stick outside the set. So if we had included the dotted line, if we take where x is greater than or equal to 0, we would not have an open set. But we didn't include it, and we do. All right. Um, that's an open set. Er, if a set isn't open, you can kind of talk about the points inside of it that do form an open set. It's the biggest open subset inside the set. Or really, we talk about, you may remember, we talk about the interior of intervals in the real line. Well, we want the interior of sets, and we just mean, OK, well, let's look at those points in this subset where we can take an open ball around it and stay inside the subset. So the interior, so it's just another definition. Again, I'm going to start with suppose E is a subset of Rn. The interior of E which we denote int E is the set of points P in E such that such that there exists a, an open ball around P that's completely contained in E, such that there exists a radius such that the ball of radius R centered at P is contained in E. So yeah, it's just those points that have open balls completely contained in E. Um, it's, uh, um, as a quick example, suppose you take the interior of a closed interval. <clears throat> well, at every point inside there other than 3 or 7, so this is in R1, so the real line, at every point there other than 3 or 7, you can take a small open interval centered at that point that's still inside the interval. But you can't do that at 3 and 7, so the interior of a closed interval is the open interval. 
On the other hand, suppose you take, suppose we take S1, so the, the one-dimensional sphere, also known as a circle, of radius, I don't care, of radius 1 centered at 1, 1 in R2. All right, all that's a fancy way of saying I take a circle of radius 1 centered at 1, 1 in R2. So I'm looking at this circle. I'm looking at that circle. What is its interior in R2? It's the empty set. It has no interior. The interior is the empty set. There are no points in the interior because you would, you know, if you take a point in the set, any open ball you pick around there contains points outside the circle. The interior of that circle is empty in R2. It has no, there are no points in there, so that every point in R2 close to it is also in the circle. Um, all right, uh, we need boundaries. We need boundary points of sets. We just need a few more definitions. So, once again, we'll suppose E is in R, a subset of Rn. I've referred intuitively to the boundary of some of the sets we've looked at. And like in this one that's still up here from before, this dotted line is the boundary of this, of this set. Now those points aren't in the set. Boundary points don't have to be in there. But what does it mean to be in the boundary? Well, what, what it means is if you take a point that's in the boundary, every open ball around it, every open ball around it should hit points both in your set and points not in your set. That's what it means to be a boundary point. If, if every single open ball around the point hits both the set you're talking about and points not in the set, then it's lying kind of, you know, it's there on the boundary between the set and what's not in the set. So that's what a boundary point is. Uh, suppose he is a, a point P. Which may or may not be an E. So let me write that explicitly. I mean, it, it's in Rn, a point P in Rn, which may or may not be an E. Is a boundary point of E. If and only if if and only if every open ball centered at P contains points in E contains points in E and points not in E. I could write this in severe set notation, but this makes it more clear, and points not in E. Yeah, and typically we do dot the boundaries of sets um, if they're not included and make them solid if they are included. <coughs> so. You know, I'll draw like two ellipses, filled in ellipses. You know, you take this set where the dots mean I'm not including those points, and I can take this set where the solid line indicates I am including it. The boundary, both in both cases as well, <laughs> would be roughly the same if I had drawn them roughly the same. But the dotted part is the boundary. Well, if this is the set A and this is the set B, this dotted part, this is still the boundary of A. The boundary of A isn't contained in A, but it's still the boundary. Boundary of A not contained in A.
But the boundary of B, the boundary of B is contained in B. Boundary is supposed to capture your intuitive notion of boundary. It's the stuff in between what's in the set and not in the set. The boundary of B is contained in B. And you probably realize we, we've caught for a, like an op when we were talking about balls, a closed ball contained its boundary. In fact, that's our definition of closed. Um, a subset of Rn is closed if and only if it contains its boundary. So definition now suppose again E is a subset of Rn what does it mean for E to be closed? Then E is closed if and only if E contains its boundary. You may have heard other definitions of closed. Um, in a way, this isn't, shouldn't be the, the topological definition if you ever looked at topology. But it's so easy to see it's equivalent to the other one. Um, so what's equivalent to this is, um, e is E is closed if and only if the set of points, so this is still contained in Rn, a subset of Rn. It's closed if and only if the points in Rn not in E so this is called the complement of E, if you know that term. Points in R and not in E form a close, uh, form an open set. Um, so uh, you, know, you can think of, oh, why is, uh, actually, let me draw this smaller. So if you want, you can think of, oh, why is this set closed? Well, it's because its complement, the set of things not in it, is open. How would you indicate that complement? Stuff not in it, you'd put this dotted line and then you'd try to sketch the rest of, shade the rest of R2. The stuff not in there is all this stuff out here. And it's not, it doesn't stop here. I was just trying to keep it from running into there. And this is an open set. So the reason that's closed is this is open, but it's usually more intuitive for us to think it's closed because it's, it contains its boundary. In multivariable calculus, that's probably how you'd like to think of it most of the time. You might think because we use the terms open and closed that every set is either open or closed. That is certainly not true. Um, open and closed don't, you know, most sets, well, in some sense of most, wouldn't be open or closed. It's trivial to give examples if you take you know, some you know, some, triang some triangular shape, fill it in, include this line, but don't include those lines. Well then, um, I don't know, include these points if you want. This set's neither open nor closed. Um, so, um, yeah, it's not, well, it's easy to see that it's not open or closed. Um, um, so you don't, I don't know, you, you don't want to think that open and closed, it's not like a door. Not everything doesn't have to be open or closed. Most things are neither. All right, we need two more terms. We need bounded and we need compact. I realize this is a lot of definitions. It's just so we can, you can refer back to them in later sections. Bounded. Bounded is actually pretty easy. Bounded, we want a subset of Rn is bounded. If it doesn't go out all, you know, all the way. <laughs> if it doesn't go out arbitrarily far, um, well, how can you say, for instance, even in R2, how can we say that a set doesn't go out arbitrarily far? Like, why is whether you know, why is this set bounded? Well, because it doesn't go out too far. Well, 
at least one way to say that. We just need one rigorous mathematical way of saying that it doesn't go out arbitrarily far. We'll say, oh, because it's contained in some ball, some open ball, or we could pick closed ball, centered at the origin in Rn, that there's some finite radius so that if you take the ball centered at the origin, it contains it. Well, yeah, then it doesn't go out arbitrarily far. Well, that's what bounded means. So E, a subset of Rn, is bounded if and only if there exists if and only if there exists r greater than zero such that e is contained in the open n ball of radius r centered at the origin. Just all that is some way of saying it doesn't go out arbitrarily far. All right, last definition, e, e, a subset of Rn, is compact if and only if E is closed and bounded Compact subspaces of Rn are going to be our replacements for closed bounded intervals in the real line. And a lot of compact spaces have a lot of subspaces, or subsets have a lot of nice properties. Um, so, for instance, the, this filled in, this filled in ellipse, it's compact if I include the boundary. It's compact because it's closed because it contains its boundary. It's bounded because it doesn't go out arbitrarily far. It's a compact subset of R2. On the other hand, if you take you know, all the real numbers where x is greater than or equal to 0, this is closed because it contains its boundary. This is closed. But it's not compact because it goes out arbitrarily far. It's not contained inside any ball of finite radius. Closed but not compact. I should say one last thing about compactness before we stop. The real, there's a, there's a branch of mathematics called topology. And um, compactness is really a, a term in topology. And there you'll see a very different definition that every open cover has a finite subcover. And, and I, don't want to, I don't want to deal with that definition. It's actually much easier for lots of for lots of statements, but it doesn't kind of capture your intuition and it's uh, harder to explain why you'd want such a thing or how to picture such a thing. This is a theorem, actually, that the compact subsets of Rn are exactly the closed and bounded subsets. It's a very important theorem called the heine borel theorem, um, but we're going to use it as our, as our definition of compact subsets, but if you ever take a topology course, you'll see that, oh yeah, this isn't the definition, this is a theorem that characterizes the compact subsets of Rn. All right, I realize that was a lot of terminology. You've got open sets, closed sets, boundary, compact sets, uh, open balls, spheres, but you know, that's not so many. And yeah, don't get too caught up in the technical definitions. You should just have the intuitive feel for it and know that you could produce a technical definition if you had to.